All right, all right. Go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 5 while I'm getting set up here with a uh, table and the microphones and all that. I wanted to point out a new uh, fun addition to your Sunday morning worship service. So um, uh, we've got, you know, I'm a fan of Jesus. Are you a fan of Jesus? Amen. Amen. I'm a fan of Cornerstone, too. And uh, just wanted to uh, really just shout out the Dixons. This was, I think, their brainchild. Um, and so you'll see in the chairs behind you, you know, some folks in the morning, you know, they're hot. I tend to be cold in here, but some people are hot. You know, it just depends. But we've got some fans. So if you're a fan of Jesus, fan of Cornerstone, or if you're getting, you know, warm in service, we've got some fans. Now, here's the deal about the fans. They need to stay here. All right. You can take your fanhood of Jesus home with you metaphorically, but you don't need to take it physically. So they've been put in inside the uh, sleeves of the chairs in front of you to get a little warm, you know, just break it on out. And, uh, you know, there it is. Pretty soon we're going to have not just fans, but hats going on, you know, all kind of stuff going. Amen. Amen. Well, um, it's good to be with you all this morning. Um, like I said, we're going to be starting in Luke 5 momentarily. Um, you may have seen recently, um, either on television or on YouTube, uh, Uber Eats has a new ad campaign going on. And uh, kind of the ad campaign on that they've got going on is, in case you forget something, we don't just deliver food, but if you forget paper, or if you forget ink, or maybe you forget a fan, right? Uber Eats, uh, they now deliver, you know, all kind of stuff outside of just food. And one of the commercials, or in some of the commercials, they've started saying, you know, man, you know, I forgot, oh, oh yeah, I forgot Uber Eats delivers other things. Now I'm going to remember that. And they say, well, every time you remember one thing, you know, it's like there's only so much space up there. So if you remember one thing, you forget something else. Right? And so there's a whole commercial with Jennifer Aniston, and she doesn't remember the Rachel haircut that she had when she was on Friends or whatever, but she remembers that Uber Eats delivers new stuff. Uh, you know, being in my 40s, um, it, it is, I can relate to this idea that, you know, when you, when you get some new information, sometimes that maybe means you forget something else. You know, I can, I can totally remember my childhood phone number, 770-413-7837, but a lot of times I forget why I walked into a room. Um, you know, I can remember lyrics to music from the 80s and 90s, but I can't remember the password that I just changed my, you know, my account to. And so maybe, maybe you've been there before, but uh, memory is an interesting thing. Actually, memory is the root word for the word memorial, from the Latin word memoria. And when you think about a memorial, you know, at least for me, I often think maybe about 9-11, or when somebody passes on, you have a memorial service to remember them. But if I'm being honest, you know, for most of my life, I don't have those same sort of associations with Memorial Day. Oftentimes, I just think about, you know, for the majority of my life, it was a, a day off from work. It was maybe a, a time to just have barbecue and be with family. I heard an ad on the uh, radio on the way in this morning said, you know, it's now Memorial Day is the start of summer. And for, for many people, if we're being honest, that's what we think of. Those are the sort of things that we think of in terms of Memorial Day. Pardon me. But if you're somebody that's lost someone serving our country, if you have a relative or a friend that was killed in action, I guarantee you it means something different. For many families across this country, tomorrow is not, you know, people aren't thinking about ribs or, you know, I, I get to sleep in. They're thinking about their brothers and sisters in arms or a father that didn't come home or, or you know, a grandfather that they never met. That's what it's going to mean for a lot of people. Looked up some... Uh, some statistics and uh, the military keeps a record of the of the deaths each year and they, it's, it's just about it's almost about two years behind so from the year uh, 2022 there were 844 deaths of active serving military members 265 of them were accidents 149 were someone uh, that passed from illness 53 were pending 18 
uh, are, are um, still undetermined, 333 were self-inflicted. Interestingly, in 2022, there were actually zero deaths from hostile combat. It's a remarkable stat, right? But regardless of what the reason was, if you have a loved one or somebody you cared about, it has a different meaning the last Monday in May. I'd like for us to just take a moment of silence, a minute. And maybe if you're someone that's lost someone, this is a time to reflect on them. If you haven't, this is a time to reflect on man, like how the freedoms that we get, whether it's freedom of religion or freedom of the press, you know, a lot of different freedom to vote, right? A lot of the freedoms that we are, we are allowed to have in this country are because there are people who have made the ultimate sacrifice. So why don't we take a minute, minute just close our eyes and honor those who died in service of our country. Amen. And thank you. In the very much same way, for a lot of people, Sunday is just the second day or maybe the third day of the weekend. It's just a day where you get to sleep in and go to brunch or something like that. But for those of us who follow Jesus, it's got to have a different significance. Every Sunday, really every day, but in particular, the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, when Chris and Ashley were sharing about Jesus and what he went through, right? We do that every Sunday. You know, I grew up in a church that only did it on first Sunday, right? But I love when I actually, you know, when I became a disciple, I understood, you know, why do we take it every Sunday? It's because we want to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we take a moment of silence every week to reflect on his ultimate sacrifice of his body and his blood. But today I want to talk a little bit about this idea of we need to remember. I did not bring my pad up there. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. The title of my lesson today is, Do You Remember the Time? Thank you, honey. My better two-thirds right there. <laughs> Do you remember the time? I want to talk about a couple of stories with Jesus and his disciples and some things that I think happened that they probably never forgot and some things that I hope that I never forget. That every week, really, and, and honestly, every day, I should remember and reflect on Jesus and what he did for me. So over in Luke chapter 5, we're going to start there in Luke chapter 5. And a little background for this. This is the calling of the first disciples. So uh, most times we read, uh, you know, Mark and Matthew's version is pretty short. It's like Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee. He saw some fishermen. He called them. They dropped everything and they followed him. They sort of give you the, the, the uh, Cliff Notes version of the story. Well, Luke gives you sort of the longer version of the story, which I like a whole lot. So some context, they had already met, uh, likely they had already sort of met Jesus through John the Baptist. Some of them had been followers of John the Baptist. They had probably heard him teach in the synagogue in Capernaum. He was staying, or at least for a time, stayed with Simon Peter. He healed his mother-in-law, healed a whole bunch of people in that town in Luke chapter 4, so much so that they're begging him to not leave the city. But he says, you know, God has sent me to a lot of different places. I've got to go to some other place. So we pick up in Luke chapter 5 with this story. And it says this in verse 1. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. 
I'm going to pause here for one moment. One of the things the elders and I have talked about is I want to tell you about Cornerstone and kind of our philosophy. I, I've come up with this phrase, ask people to use their boat. So they're on vacation this week. But again, you know, a couple weeks ago, you saw uh, Phelan and Sydney Henry get baptized. And it was kind of, it was interesting thing about the service. We had to kind of figure out when everybody was going to get baptized because Phelan was drumming. Samara got baptized that same day. And if you remember, her and her father, they were singing a song. I have a philosophy here, right? We need to ask people to use their boat. Sometimes somebody's coming out to church, right? And they've got gifts and they've got talents and they've got ways in which they'd like to serve God. And guess what? They may not yet be a member of Cornerstone, but we still need to allow people to use their boat for Jesus. Right? I mean, look, I mean, if you look at what happened, how the Henry family was pulled in, we, we need it, you know, Asia does an amazing job drumming, but Asia said, I don't want to drum every Sunday, you know, and so we had, you know, we had a need, and Phelan said, I'm a drummer. Imagine the response if I had said, well, you need to go through all this stuff and do all this to become a member, and then we'll let you drum. Right? Imagine we said, no, Samara, no, you cannot bless the mom. You, you, you and your dad cannot sing and bless the moms with a song because you haven't gotten baptized yet. Now, we're not letting non-members teach in children's class. I'm gonna let, I will assure you of that. But can they be an usher? Can they sing on stage? Can they play an instrument? There are lots of ways that people can serve them. Maybe haven't made the full commitment. We need to let people use their boat. All right? So I love this story about Jesus because he asked Peter to use his boat, and we're going get, to get to the rest of the story. We actually asked him to follow. Picking up in verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled the boat so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you'll be catching men. You'll be catching people alive, is what the translation says in Greek. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. I love that, you know, Jesus had the, 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 the mindset to say, you know what? This is a guy that I think I want to maybe invest in at some point. I'm going to ask him to use his boat. And it led to this miraculous catch of fish that we see described here in John, I'm sorry, in, in, in Luke chapter 5, 1 through 14. Now, why was Peter reluctant? Peter was reluctant for a couple of reasons. Well, Jesus says, put out into deep waters. Number one, he was reluctant because it was inconvenient. They had already cleaned their nets and worked all night. You know, sometimes when God calls you, it's not going to be what you think is a convenient time. Right? Another reason he was reluctant is because it was tiresome. They had already worked all night. He was tired. You know, fishermen in those days worked overnight. They had these things called trammel nets, and, and during the day the fish could see the nets, so they did it overnight. So he was tired. It was bad strategy. Again, it was better to fish at night, and it was also better to not fish in deep water. Those nets were especially uh, useful in shallow waters. And so Jesus saying, put it out into deep water, it's kind of like, that don't make sense. Finally, it was embarrassing. It's like, all right, Jesus, you, you, you're a great teacher and all. You even heal some people, but you don't know about fishing. <laughs> I mean, this rabbi carpenter, what do you know about fishing? I'm sure. Peter's going through his mind. So Peter's a little bit reluctant, but I love, you know, uh, he says, we worked all night long, and Jesus probably just gave him a look. But because you say so, I'll go ahead, and I'll, and I'll throw the nets out. And he does, and, and they bring in the mother load. Peter was just as amazed as his companions, but honestly, this moment led Peter to start thinking about something else. He realized who he was in relation to Jesus and told Jesus, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I love this about our God. A lot of times we think we're not ready to have twins when we've already got a one-year-old. <laughs> we might think, man, I'm only 19 years old. Can I really commit to Jesus? I've got a lot of financial problems or I've even got health problems. We can think a lot. We can make up a lot of reasons. I dare even say maybe excuses for why we can't answer God's call. And God is saying, guess what? I qualify the called. I don't call the qualified. 
When I called you, I've already factored in your idiocy, your stupidity, your mistakes, your immaturity, whatever you fill in the blank. I've already factored it in. And he said, but you know what, Peter? You catch people from now on, you're going to catch men alive. You catch fish and they die. What we're going to be doing, you're going to catch people and they're going to live forever. And so the first point is a lot of times we need to remember the future. When God calls you, he's got a plan for you. He's saying, I'm going to do some great things with you. He said, Peter, you're a fisherman. You're not going to become a fisher of men. And guess what? We need to remember the future. We need to remember the future that we have. Number one, just what will life be like walking with Jesus? If we believe him to be who he says he is, if we believe what the scriptures say about him, what is this life going to be like walking with him? It's life to the full. It's life with purpose. It's life with mission. You ever felt like you're just wandering in life? What, what is my purpose? What is my mission? What am I, what am I meant to do here? What am, I, what am I here for? Guess what? God wants to use you as he is redeeming the entire universe, not just people in Duluth, not just Cornerstone Church, not just Gwinnett County or the United States. God is redeeming the entire universe, right? He didn't retire and go into full-time ministry from running the universe, right? Like God is trying to redeem all of creation. And he's, he's saying, you know what, Trevor Toth? I know it was a rough year for you. I'm redeeming some amazing stuff. I know it's tough. From now on, you're going to be catching people alive. I've got a future and a hope for you. Right? I understand, Cook family, that it was difficult last year. You went through some difficulties. I guess from, you know what? You don't have to be away from, I want you near me because from now on, there's somebody that only you out in Loganville or how, y'all, y'all are far, wherever it is out there on that side of Gwinnett, you know, there is somebody that only you can reach. Remember the future, not just your future, but the future of people around you. Remember the future. And on top of that, you don't like the name you got? You, you, get, you know, we don't generally get to pick our name. Our parents pick it. Actually, I love Fenton. I love my name. I'm like, yes, I'm a Fenton. My first name is James, though, you know, but I go by Fenton. I like Fenton. I, you know, it's funny. Natasha will sometimes say, we get mail, we get something. Like, who's James Gardner? Isn't that your dad? Like, no, no it's me, you know. But, but, <laughs> but if you don't like your name, guess what? You get a new name in heaven. You don't, you, you've not been able to buy the clothes you want. What is it? Gucci, Tommy, what, what, I don't know. Ovo, I don't know the stuff, you know, whatever the brands are, right? <laughs> Gonna give you a new robe. You maybe didn't have the type of housing that you always wanted. Maybe, maybe you're poor. Maybe you've struggled financially in this life. In my house are many mansions. In my house are many rooms. And Jesus is like, I've got a place just for you. You need to remember the future. We got to remember the future. And I think from that moment on, Peter and those guys' life was changed forever. We do remember, it's not just about getting to heaven, because guess what? To be honest, most days we're not thinking about heaven. If we're being fair, we're being honest, we're not thinking about it. We generally think about it when maybe when somebody passes or when it's just really hard and we're like, oh, I don't want to be here anymore. But, you know, we, you know, but th- this life with Jesus, we, we had the theme last year of with, life with God. He said, from now on, if you follow, as you follow me, you're going you're gonna to catch people alive. I've got a future and a hope for you laid out. Amen. So over in uh, Luke chapter 22, we have another moment, moment of remembrance. So at the Last Supper, Jesus tells Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to not deny three times that you know me. And Peter emphatically insists, hey, you know, you got you got to appreciate Peter's passion, but also sometimes that arrogance is just crazy to sit there with everybody else at the table. And the basically, I can imagine the scene. He's pointing them. Even if all these other jokers deny you, I never will. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> just can't even imagine that, you know. But, you know, we all have prideful moments and we all get there, right? <laughs> and he's like, even if everybody else denies you, I never will. Even if I have to go with you to prison and to death, I'll never deny you. A few hours later, in the, in the story that the Maxwells uh, talked about today, they go out to pray with Jesus, and these same guys that said, we'll die with you, wouldn't stay up for one hour to pray. 
We're going to die for you, Jesus. We'll go with you to prison and jail, but pray? Man, what a, what a, what a lesson there is in that, though. It's so interesting because a lot of us, I think, would say, you know what? I'd die for God. More often, than that, we're, we're fortunate. Back to those freedoms we get because a lot of people sacrifice. In this life, most of us are not going to be in the position where we're having to die for God. But he is asking, will you live for me? Will you live for me? Right? I'm not, most cases, we're not being asked to die for him. But will you live for him? Right? And so... You know, Jesus um, is out. He goes to pray. They fall asleep. Judas leads a mob to come and arrest Jesus. And then we pick up in Luke chapter 22. We're going to pick up in verse uh, 54. It says, they, si- they seized him, led him away, and brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, together and Peter sat among them. When a servant saw him sitting there in the light, looked closely at him, she said, This man was with him too, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. About an hour later, another kept insisting. This man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So much in this text. Starts off, it says, Peter was following Jesus at a distance. Again, that's a whole nother sermon. Don't got time for it. But are you following Jesus closely or at a distance? Because if we truly remember our future, if we remember what he's promised us, I want to be right with him because come hell or high water, I know he's got me, right? But Peter started following him at a distance. And this guy that said, man, this guy was willing to cut off somebody's ear in the garden, said he'd go with him to prison and to death. He's afraid of a servant girl. Man, I don't know him. I'm not. And it's interesting. Luke's account tells us that this happens over an hour. Peter had an hour to start to, to, to kind of reflect on this denial, to think about what was going on. And, and sometimes it's like that. I've been there. Sometimes you're in sin and you're just in sin and you just you're struggling. And it, you know that you need to get out of it. You know, you need to talk to somebody, you know, you need to. And you just didn't. You know, Peter's been there. I've been there. I'm sure you've been there. Right. But. It goes on and it gets to the point, another account says he gets to the, he gets to this position where he's calling down curses on himself. The guy come up and he's like, yo, accent, you got that Northern accent. You know, it's like that, you know, folks from New York, I'm walking down the hall with my bull, right? (laughs) You're doing what? Down here, I'm walking down the hall with my ball, y'all, right? Uh, you know, but they're like, Peter, you, you know, you've got that Galilean accent. You're one of them. And it, and it says, he starts, I don't bleep it, he bleep, know that man. And he makes such a scene, he makes such a ruckus that I'm sure not just Jesus, but everybody's eyes turn like, what's going on over there? And it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. We talked about remembering the future. You also got to remember the present. I think that in that present moment, there was, I I bet it felt like an eternity. Jesus had already been spit on, beat somewhat, maybe already had bloody eyes, a bloody nose, swollen lip, and he turned. Peter makes such a scene that he turns and he looks right at him. And I imagine, again, Peter probably never forgot that moment. That moment probably seemed like it lasted for an eternity. This is a moment that, that, that changed Peter's life forever. He goes outside and weeps bitterly. You ever wept bitterly? You ever wept? I mean, like, ugly crying. Like, worse than Byron when Samara got baptized. I mean, you know, like, it was just, you know, it was, you know... <laughs> Like, I can't see, right? Like, you know. (laughs) It was such a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful moment. But this was not tears of happiness. This was guilt, remorse, shame. About three years into being a disciple, I've told this story before, I really blew it. I went back to some old ways, some old things, some immorality, made some terrible decisions. I remember 
uh, going out to pray with a brother by the name of Austin McDonald, Georgia Tech, and then going and talking to Kevin Thompson and Charles. And I just, I just remember weeping bitterly. And it's just something about in that moment when you remember that prayer, like I feel like my, oh, I feel it in my stomach right now thinking about it. Just thinking about it. I feel it. All right. There's sometimes that in, in your pain, even in your, in your mistakes and whatever, like you just got You just got to take in that moment. We try to just skeet past it a lot of times and skip over the pain, whether that's sin that you caused on yourself or somebody else's sin. It doesn't matter. A lot of times it hurts, right? When you've been damaged, whether you did it or somebody else did it, you, you've been damaged. And, and we live in a society where just the next thing get to the next thing. And sometimes we got to learn to in, just, just be in that present moment and let it change us Amen. and let it change us. Because I think Peter in that moment he was, he was going to be different from er, forever. Now, he was still a sinner. He still made some, some mistakes, but he was going to be different forever. Because that moment, it, again, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to, to go and I'm sure interview Peter about this. And Peter would have been the only one, you know, to know this happened. And, and, and he's going back and telling the story about what happened with Jesus. And he tells this story. I look, you know, I looked right at him and he looked right at me. We've got to remember the present. They say... The reason it's called the present is because it's a gift, right? Even the hard stuff you're going through, right? You're going to be able to help somebody else. Hey, look, how many people have already met with twins since the whole scenario and giving advice to somebody else? Guess what? Trevor's going to be able to tell somebody about the faithfulness of God when it was difficult and he didn't have a job and it was tough and they were struggling and God is faithful because he's not the last person that's going to go through a scenario like that. Right. Remember the present when you're going through, whether it means journaling, whether it means talking to people about it, whether it means just sitting in it and really like remember the present. Don't let that feeling be wasted. Turn over to John chapter 21. We're going to go back to the Sea of Galilee for another really cool moment of remembrance in the life of Peter. So Jesus had died and buried, raised on the third day. He had made several appearances. He tells his disciples to go, um, go back to Galilee where they'll see him. And we get this appearance in John chapter 21. Pardon me. Starting in verse one, it says this. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. So Lake of Ga uh, Sea of Galilee, Lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Tiberias, all the same body of water. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast your net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. A couple of points in this. So all seven of these disciples probably weren't fishermen, but when Simon says he's going out to fish, he has some buddies to go with him on this journey. You know, this past semester, we've been working in our connection groups. We've had uh, ladies lunch connection groups. We've had uh, runners connection groups. We've had mind, body, and soul health connection groups. We've had, you know, uh, Latino Bible talk connection groups. We've had singers, all kind of connection groups. And here's the deal. Uh, for this summer, uh, if you would like to continue your group, you, that, that is fine for you to do so. You know, a lot of people got some momentum. They want to keep it going. 
We, are, we do really want to ask you, though, for our four Summer Serve projects. Lish is going to talk about that a little bit in the announcements. Um, don't miss out on them for a connection group. Okay, we want to have a summer of service, right? Four Wednesdays this summer, and we want you to be all in on that. Right. And so the elders and I are going to be, you know, talking to people, see how it went. We're going to do an assessment. If we want to maybe start connection groups back up full fledged in the fall, we'll let you know. But the point is, he has some people to go out, hang out with him. I'm going out to fish. They said, we'll go with you. If you're going to remember your future, if you're going to remember those present moments, you need some people that'll go fishing with you. You need some people that'll go walking with you. You need some people that, I didn't join this group, but you need some people that'll go running with you, you know? <laughs> you need an anime group. I love that group. You need an anime. You need an anime, you know, anime and God, anime and Jesus group, right? You need some people to do life with you, to have connections with you, if you're going to remember the Lord. But, uh, you know, they go on, and as they're fishing, I love Jesus showing up and just kind of, hey, have y'all caught any fish? And they're like, nah. He's like, cast your net on the right side of the boat. I started to think, at this moment, the butterflies, the good ones, started rumbling, and some people said, wait, guess, okay, and they, they, they do it, and suddenly, they pull in this large number of fish, so many, you know, they, they couldn't even, they almost couldn't even haul it in. And what I think Jesus is doing here, here he wanted to remind them of when they were first called. He wanted them, third point today, to also, we talked about remember the future, remember the present. He wants you to remember the past. I love this comparison, right? Lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Tiberias, same, same, same body of water. They had worked all night and caught nothing. They worked all night and caught nothing here. Cast your net into deep water. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. There was a great number of fish in Luke 5, a large number of fish, 153 specifically. Somebody counted, and I love that. <laughs> in Luke 5, the nets began to tear. In John 21, the nets didn't tear. I love this. In Luke 5, Peter is moved, and he says, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He wanted to get away from Jesus. Here, it is the Lord. He jumped. He wanted to race to Jesus. And I think the crucifixion, the resurrection changes that. You understand, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I got mistakes. Yes, I'm in the presence of a holy man. But he wants to be near me. He wants to move through me. He wants to use me. I want to be by him. And he swam 100 yards to Jesus. Vicki, you need to write a, 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 you and Greg need to write a book called 100 Yards to Jesus. You know, about football and Jesus or something like that, you know. Uh, but he swam, he, you know, he swam 100 yards to Jesus. He raced to get to Jesus. And at the end of Luke 5, he tells him, from now on, you're going to catch people. We don't have time. But he keeps reading. He, he restores Peter. Peter denied him three times. He asks him three times, do you love me? And at the end, he says, feed my sheep. It was catch people, feed my sheep. These stories are meant to be parallel. Why? He wanted to remind them. Remember when you were first called. It's, it's been so awesome the last few weeks to see all these people get baptized. It, it just reminded me, Sheridan Colony Square, Hotel in downtown Atlanta, when I, you know, I'm thinking about my own conversion. What was it like for you when you decided to make Jesus Lord and you got baptized? What did you think about going, going to the bathroom to dry off? What was the first quiet time you had the next day? Who was the first person you shared your faith with after that? What was that feeling like as the water's dripping and you just felt sin free. Come hell or high water, I'm good. You know God's Holy Spirit was implanted in you. You've been sealed. Your name is in the Lamb. What was that like? You see, in Revelation, there's a passage where he says, remember your first love. You've forgotten. Cornerstone, if we're going to remember the future, if we're going to remember the present, we've also got to remember the past. Think about what you were like. Man, it's a crazy story. This Fenton Gardner is sitting up here as an evangelist at Cornerstone Church. If you know my life and know my story. But man, when I, when I think about the goodness of Jesus, the grace and mercy of God, and where, I'm, where I've come from, it is remarkable. We've got to remember the past as well. Some of these details, whether it's 153 fish or 
The breakfast was on a fire when they got on the shore. Jesus already had some for them. These are the details only an eyewitness could provide. I love, again, it's not the purpose of it, but the fact that people saw this. These are not just cleverly invented stories. These things happened, right? Our faith isn't just based on faith. It's also based on fact and historical reality of some things that happened. But if we can just remember the past, remember what you were like before. Paul even tells them, remember what you were like when you were called. Not many of you were of noble birth, right? He tells them. Remember what you were when you were called. Today, I want to encourage you to remember the future. Know where we're going. When we walk with him, he's got us. Know where we're going. New name, new clothes, streets of gold, pearly gates. Remember the future that awaits us. But also remember the present. Whatever you've got going on right now, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're going through, whether it's good or bad, whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley, be in that moment. Feel it. Let it change you. Right? But also remember the past. Know that God has not let you down. Once, he's not going to start today, right? Think about where he's called you from and what he has called you to. So that's my encouragement today. As we remember those who sacrificed and made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms in this country, let us also remember our commander in chief at the right hand of God who made the ultimate sacrifice so we can have the freedom that lasts for forever. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to have some closing announcements and a closing song. Amen.